And it's a risk that you face alone. There's nobody else who will face that, face that risk for you. None of your employees will. I've endured more, more than my share of hard times. And the dreams are what kept me going during these hard times. I'm passionate, passionate about what I wanted to create and no challenge was going to come in my way. That's the only way I could describe myself. My advice to you is that if you're going to become an entrepreneur, it has to start with your dreams and a passionate conviction that nothing will get in the way of those dreams. Challenges of being an entrepreneur are so great that you need your dreams to keep you going even when everything around you makes you want to give up. My dreams are not enough to be a successful, on, but dream, I'm sorry, the, my, but, but dreams are not enough to be a successful entrepreneur. I wanted to share with you some practical gu guidance that I've learned. I've been a CEO of companies for over 20 years now, but I've always viewed myself as an accidental CEO. When I started out, I wanted to conceptualize and invest and professional management executing the vision. The reality is that execution is as much part of entrepreneurship as vision. And I've had to lead the execution myself. My first piece of advice is that you should never forget that success of a business is measured by its cash flow. All of the vision in the world cannot substitute for cash. And even businesses with lofty valuations eventually need to generate cash. Ventures requiring more liquidity than entrepreneur, ventures will always require more liquidity than an entrepreneur thinks he needs. And almost every challenge that I've had to meet in my career has to do with cash. And not anticipating how much cash I've needed during difficult times. There are three golden rules. More cash is better than less cash. Cash today is better than cash tomorrow. And third, never run out of cash. If you remember these three things, you will have a sound business. I only wish I often listen to my own advice. Second, finding the right partner. The team and the partner is very important to being a successful entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are remembered by their partners. Steve Jobs had Steve Wozniak, Bill Gates had Paul Allen, and Mahatma Gandhi had Nehru, Sardar Patel, and Rajaji. But nothing sinks a business faster than having a wrong partner. And I've had a few disastrous ones in my life. Always make sure all expectation with your partners and your team members are set well in advance, that your partnership can test the ego challenges, and that economics between partners are well documented, and agreed to in advance and in a fair manner. Third, never under underestimate the power of crossover skills. I define crossover skills as people who have two talents, a primary one and a secondary one. The engineer who can sell, a lawyer who can understand numbers, accountant who learns the technology, these are all people who are the best professionals. Even if you don't have crossover skills, make sure that people around you Someone has crossover skills if you want to make your business succeed. Always hire the best, even if it costs you a little bit more. Companies succeed or fail on the quality of its people. And without question, the best organizations have the best people. Fourth, understand the value of entry and exits. You can run a great business, but often the great biggest driver of value is the price at which you buy in and the price at which you sell out. Finance people instinctively understand this and engineers do not. Five, do not be scared of raising any debt. Many of the most successful business are leverage buyouts. Some of the greatest success stories in the recent times in the U.S. are leveraged buyouts. Debt creates discipline, allows an entrepreneur to retain control. It's a useful financing tool that many people ignore but out of fear. I want to conclude by, by returning to my original theme. Conventional wisdom thinks of entrepreneurs as business people. I agree, but however, 
I think it's worth thinking of an entrepreneur in a role that is bigger than that. So, the concept of an entrepreneur in a nation building is, is a theme that I would like to just present for a few minutes. Entrepreneurship is, a, is again about having a dream, conceptualizing the dream and executing upon the con this conception in, in new and innovative ways. We cannot restrict entrepreneurship only to technology and private sector domains. I think that the greatest nation builders were, were exemplary entrepreneurs as well. My father, Dr. V. Krishnamurti, spent his whole career turning around public sector companies such as BHEL, Maruti, and Steel Authority of India into profitable world building firms. No one in the 70s and the 80s believed that it, this could be done. And he proved them wrong. He did all of this without ever regard for his personal wealth. I think that is real entrepreneurship. If today, if you were to see the Indian automobile industry, it is as a result of what was created at Maruti, the, the supply chain that got created at Maruti, the incredible amount of sophistication that came as a result of a technological revolution that took place at that point in time. Or if you look at Steel Authority of India, the, which is today considered a Navaratna, it is the most profitable well-managed steel industry today and every steel company including ArcelorMittal depends on its management talent out of Steel Authority of India. It's a public sector company and BHEL today is still the beacon of hope when it comes to energy technology in India. So for someone to have created those three, it is, I think, at a point in time and it was difficult, I think, is, is, is speaks of outstanding entrepreneurship of a variety India has never seen. Martin Luther King is a definition of an entrepreneur in my mind. So is Nelson Mandela. He had a dream that American blacks could live in equality and dignity. Conceptualized a civil rights movement to make a dream, his dream a reality and made that civil rights movement one of the most effective movements the world has ever seen. Jim Grant at UNICEF is another outstanding example of entrepreneurship in public space. His passion redefined the way we deliver public health. Nobody believed that mass humanizations in, in, in India and Africa were possible until he made it happen. His entrepreneurship saved more lives than were lost in the 20th century. Professors of IIT, including my father-in-law, Dr. V. J. Ramachandran, who was instrumental in building IIT into great educational institutions are entrepreneurs. With scarce resources and only a vision to guide them, they've created excellence in these institutions. Entrepreneurial principles are not, uh, our entrepreneurial principles are nation building principles and entre entrepreneurship broadly applied can build a nation. My parting message to you is, whatever you choose to do in your life, think like an entrepreneur. Dream big, follow your dreams, turn your dreams into, into an actionable vision, evangelize your vision, and lead people with that vision. Execute with integrity and never compromise on your principles. Never compromise on your dreams. Never turn back on the country that nurtured you. With those, I will just put one slide which is dear to me. I, I look nation building as a dance. In, in India, we always talk about Bharatanatyam, one person dancing. But in the Western world, it's all about a groups of people dancing. And as Yet said, how can you, in the, in the West, you never know the dancer from the dance. So nation building is like a dance. It's entrepreneurship, undying passion for entrepreneurship, and the, the essence of entrepreneurship creates this dance known as nation building. And I hope all of you blossom into one and build a nation. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. But we see that uh, Japan and 
Korea uh, have emerged as global leaders in certain industries. Uh, when can we see that happening by Indian companies? What Indian industries can take, uh, you know, a globally uh, could be the global leaders, and in what industries and what industries could come up from India, totally self-reliant, uh, just like you know, uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, the Silicon Valley supported uh, the growth of Microsoft and later on uh, uh, Google. So, what what industries uh, you know can can crop up from India uh, now? I I think uh, for my perception is that. Um, um, India has got one of the s significant strengths of India is that the labor pool it has and for a foreseeable future. So anything that's labor intensive would, would be the logical choice that everybody would say to you where India will excel. But the fact remains that India will excel in every area there is there are some provisos, there are some restrictions. If you take the automobile industry, for example, we were able to put out a car known as Nano at $2,500. So there is, I believe that India has the capability to build and excel in automobiles. If you look at what an, today in our, an industry cannot be built, in a globalized world it cannot be built just relying on India alone. But what you do have in India, use the strengths. For example, what Tata did with Jaguar Land Rover, keep in mind, Jaguar Land Rover had the technology expertise of BMW at one point in time. It had the technology expertise of Ford built into it at a certain point in time. And that technology expertise, if we were to together pull it with Tata's, you're going to see probably a great revolution for India becoming a very self-reliant, very technologically sophisticated automobile industry over the next 10 years. So every industry that I see, India can be a factor to reckon with. But keep in mind, it's the Indians who are pulling, us, pulling ourselves down and not the foreigners. So you have to necessarily understand that you have to overcome that particular barrier before you can get to that stage. Otherwise, there is a fair chance that India will get acquired, Indian companies will get acquired by foreign companies thereby we become a economic dependent on a foreign company then to build it ourselves. So the opportunities are great. One final opportunity where I believe that India can be really great, which I think where the opportunity exists uh, at a level that nobody has even thought about. It is what I call as village, village economy. Um, keep in mind the whole world is built around, including China is built around urbanization. If you look at the U.S., it's 90% urbanized versus 10% semi, I mean, uh, rural. China is going towards 70% urban, 30% rural. India currently is at 25% urban, 75% rural. Think of it if Chennai were to be inundated with five times the population of what it has today or six times the population of what it has today. Consequences are going to be dramatic. So I believe that India is going. In, India needs to move away from these city-centered economies to village-centric economies. And I think if you look at food security as one major area, I would say to you that India that is a probably the greatest single opportunity that exists for India to become the food producer of the world, um, village-based economy of the world. I think that's a possibility that one should look at. I'm going from two extremes. But I think that is the opportunity that exists.